Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session will begin. At that time, if you would like to ask a question, press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I would like to turn the meeting over to Ms. Joyce Rose. Thank you and you may begin. Welcome to the Procurement and Contract Management Webinar Series brought to you on behalf of the Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, Children's Bureau, and presented by ICF International. I am Joyce Rose, your host and moderator for today's webinar, Managing Scope Change versus Scope Creep. Next. Changing, it, changes in uh, funding availability and priority mean that opportunities for in-person discussions and networking among professionals working on agency child welfare IT systems are limited. As an alternative, the Division of State Systems within the Children's Bureau is offering a series of webinars supporting information sharing and discussion. The content of the webinars is structured so as to appeal to a wide audience participating in an agency's child welfare IT initiatives, including state and tribal welfare staff. Next. As I mentioned previously, today's webinar in the Procurement and Contract Management series is entitled Managing Scope Change versus Scope Creep which I think you will find unique and interesting as our guest presenters have a wealth of experience managing their state CWIS initiatives. Please note that our previously intended March webinar has been or was postponed due to extenuating circumstances, and we are looking forward to rescheduling this webinar in the near future. The next scheduled webinar is in May, and it's entitled, Preparing to Say Goodbye to Your Vendor. Next. Attendees are encouraged to participate in our webinar with questions and comments. All of the participant lines are muted now, but we will open them for the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. However, please be aware that you can submit questions at any time using the GoToWebinar chat feature, and those will be addressed during the Q&A session. Should we run out of time, we will respond to your questions via email, and or should you have additional questions, you may submit those to me at the email address listed on the slide, joyce at kassets.com. We are very interested in knowing who is attending this webinar. It is our intent throughout all of the webinars to make the content applicable and attractive for everyone participating in an agency's child welfare information system effort. We ask that you self-select one of the five categories listed. My colleague, Elizabeth, will conduct the poll. Responding to the poll, we'll just give them a couple more seconds here to fill in. Go ahead and cast your vote. We'll close it in just another couple seconds here. Okay. And it looks like we have 14% state child welfare information systems project managers. Uh, overwhelming majority, 71% are state child welfare information system program policy or technical staff. Uh, we don't have any tribal project managers, but we do have 5% uh, tribal welfare, child welfare information system program policy or technical staff. And another 10% of our participants today are ACF um, or Children's Bureau staff personnel or leadership. I am very pleased that we have a large percentage of uh, combo of program, policy, and or technical staff because I think the whole um, <clears throat> interest in scope and scope management and scope creep is, is really applicable uh, in our, in our um, challenges uh, in today's large system development. So um, excellent. Let's move on and take a quick look at today's agenda. 
Elizabeth, if you can catch up our slides, please. <clears throat> They should be caught up. Have, are we not seeing them? Um, I still have the poll, and now I have managing scope, and here's the agenda. Thank you very much. Um, we will do, I will do some introductions of our wonderful guest panelists. Um, we'll talk about what our objectives are for this webinar. Uh, we're going to establish the context uh, around the whole um, uh, area of scope. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how SCOPE uh, is impacted by a application development methodology or can be impacted. Uh, in, intermingled will be um, some discussion between our, our guest presenters, and we'll finish with an attendee Q&A session, and I really encourage you to ask questions because these folks um, have been... Uh, associated with their state SACLIS for quite a few years, so they're, they're highly um, uh, informative. So, and then we'll do a little um, wrap-up session. So let's start with our introduction of our panel participants. Um, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to welcome Tom Kine, Lori Johnson, Colleen Masuno, and Susan Stockwell. Tom uh, has been employed in the technology industry since 1975, and he has been associated with the Social Services Information System, SSIS, which is Minnesota's SACLIS effort, since 1993. He is currently the SSIS Division Director and Minnesota's SACLIS Manager. And although technology has changed drastically over the last 35 years, one constant has been the need for smart, dedicated people who can innovate using the tools at hand. So Tom says the best thing about Minnesota's SACLIS project is working with people uh, with those qualities. Lori Johnson has more than 20 years of child welfare experience and since 2009 has served as SACLIS project director and is responsible for the current Michigan SACLIS implementation, which will be going live April 30th. Um, Lori received the Best of Michigan Government Technology Award for Best IT collaboration for the design and implementation of the current new birth match process. Lori has presented nationally on best practice SACLIS solutions, the new birth match process for the Department of Health and Human Services, the CDC, and the National Child Abuse Neglect Data Conference on Child Welfare Data Warehouse Reporting. Colleen is the Director of Federal Regulations, Data, and Policy. She brings 20-plus years of child welfare experience with both the Division of Family and Children's Services and Division of Mental Health. Colleen joined the SACLIS project in June 2004, where she served as the project manager for the state and most recently as the director until August of 2013. However, the Georgia SACLIS, named Shines, remains under her purview and has a new director in place. Susan Stockwell joined the Pennsylvania Department of Public Welfare as the Director of Systems and Data Management in the Office of Children, Youth, and Families in 1992. Prior to employment with the Commonwealth, she was a caseworker with Lebanon County Children and Youth Services. Susan is leading a project to develop a statewide child welfare IT solution for Pennsylvania. We are so pleased to have these experienced and qualified individuals as our guest presenters and myself, formerly the project director for the state of Wisconsin, SACWIS, uh, retiring from state service in 2004. And since that time, I have been involved with several ACF Children's Bureau-sponsored training events. So with that introduction, uh, let us look at our webinar objectives. Uh, we want to define the differences between scope creep and scope change. Uh, identify key strategic areas for planning, monitoring, and managing project scope. Discuss the causes and remedies of project scope creep. We will learn how an application development methodology may encourage or discourage scope creep. And then we want to, and I really encourage um, a hearty discussion not only between our presenters but also our attendees who are on the phone. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Lori. <clears throat> Thank you, Joyce. Um, so first, first, I'd like to uh, 
uh, go through um, some basic strategy that uh, probably many of you know about and PMBOK related. It is uh, how Michigan managed the, their uh, SACWAS as far as their approach to gathering requirements, planning, and the project monitoring and control piece. We are currently going live April 30th, and so this is very, um, very relevant uh, topic for me uh, to to give it current information on. We we basically have two buckets of of or two cylinders of, of how we approach this in Michigan, and really it is it was initially the collecting of requirements and defining the scope, and then throughout the process, how are we going to you know monitor those uh, those controls, um, verify scope with the vendor in that initial uh, acquisition, and then long term control that scope throughout the uh, development phase of the project. Next. One of the key areas that I think of, of Michigan's success and, and ability to uh, monitor change controls throughout the development period is that we spent significant planning time and we used our federal liaison um, on consult and monthly guidance. This was an invaluable piece uh, throughout, the, throughout the project. We did have monthly calls with our ACF uh, liaison, Pete, Pete Howe, and throughout the planning process as well as the development design phases, this is really a critical partnership and it was also very valuable uh, within our governance to be able to use that information that we that Pete would provide in kind of a guidance in a guidance way, so we developed um, it, there was a, a template the planning advanced planning document and this is before your you know your implementation advanced planning document or initial excuse me initial advanced planning document. This really set set course for us. We did a full. During this process, we did a full gap and feasibility study, and really that took our old system, which is SWIFT, and what we needed for the new system. Uh, Michigan is on, under a unique situation in, in a modified um, settlement agreement, and under court order, uh, we were to develop and design and implement a SAC with, within a period of time. So. That stated, the gap and feasibility study was it was absolutely a uh, kind of critical point of us of our planning. Within that gap in feasibility, we were able to um, expose 2,800 initial requirements were, that were put into a, a matrix. Um, also, uh, part of our uh, planning was a cost benefit, and really we took the type of sacrifices. Um, many of you know. Um, a transfer system. A lot of our, our SACWISs are transfer systems. Uh, we compared that to an overall from scratch uh, building. And so we went through with the cost benefit of each with it given our time and our level of comfort and as well as our budget uh, was satisfied by a transfer system. We then took the gap feasibility cost benefit and we went out with our request for a proposal. And really, that when you talk about the collection of requirements and you're going out and giving that information to the pot potential vendors, which are our de development design and implementation vendors, was really important. One of the things that we found that assisted us in getting the best vendor to meet our requirements was to provide a public-facing procurement library, which really is about our old system. And part of that procurement library had our gap and our feasibility, our gap and our feasibility study. Next. So with these 2,800 requirements, and this was Largely, we, we leaned on um, the expertise of our, our liaison and the experience of understanding what initially could we, could we get done within a period of time. 
So all 2,800 requirements were mapped and, and into kind of a traceability matrix, if you will. And they are all, you know, the, the bones, the, 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 what, what you need in a SACWA system. And it's very, I mean, from the business perspective, this was a, a very high level kind of rapid requirements um, initial initial check is about 2,800. Um, we didn't. We initially uh, probably could have gone into the 4,000 range. Uh, that's not where you want to be going in procuring and um, procuring a SACWIS is to have an over scope of requirements because eventually you're just going to have to cut back. So around 2,800, we was feasible within a 36 month period of time with our current um, transfer uh, transfer application. The Again, okay. monitoring and, and management. Oops, that's okay. We just the the met, we there's three different strategies in, in defining our scope, and they were when we we reviewed vendors in three different capacities. A requirement could have met been met by the transfer system. It could have met by a cost a canned off the shelf, or it could be with new development. Within this transfer system. The vendor, the, the vendor estimated that approximately 70% of the transfer system would meet our 2,800 requirements. Next. So monitoring and management of scope. The Michigan, change, the Michigan change controls that were generated during the duration of our development phase were in two buckets. Um, the transfer system underestimated our gaps. That 70% that was initially put in our, our RFP and eventually put in within our contract and held that, that, that vendor to that contract um, was, was underestimated. Uh, so really, we ended up about 60% of using that transfer system, and then 40% was new development. Um, also within that period of time, and I, I believe Colleen is going to touch on this, is that there are always, during that period of time, because it takes so long to, to design and develop a system, even if it's a transfer system, there are new federal policies that create change controls, as well as there is new state policies that they would like to, I guess, I guess so, um, initiate during the phase. So eventually, there has to be some sort of, of freezing of, of requirements. Next. So our, our key strategies for uh, preventing um, scope creep were really about managing that initial contract with the vendor and holding them to task based on the original set of requirements. So the contract utilizing the contract and that initial contract with the vendor and trying to monitor and having that change control process fluid throughout throughout the 36 months was very important. Also, you know, business representation um, in, in static business representation, having knowledge of those re working requirements and knowing and expanding and contracting along the way. Part of the, I think part of the, the success of Michigan, if you will, is that the business drove the requirements and we, this was a jointly, joint collaboration with our state DTMB, but we, the, the business owned the requirements from the beginning. And this became, this became very self-evident in, in the management and, and monitoring throughout that 36 month period. Also, one of the things that when we went into the initial procurement or acquisition of the vendor is we looked at what could Michigan do internally safely um, that we wouldn't that would not that we could control the scope as well so part of the what Michigan did is they completed a service level agreement with their own with the own our own site, uh, state IT uh, to complete our data house and report one of the key uh, considerations in the modified settlement agreement was our was Michigan's inability to to report any kind of analytics 
or case monitoring through our SACWIS of our child welfare system. We had a very robust data warehouse with our Swiss, but we're really unable to manufacture any kind of or create any kind of flow of reports um, with feeding from our, our Swiss system. We took the same architecture and con our state contractors and, and put that in an agreement outside of the large vendor contract or our core system contract. And as a result of that, we are now sitting at the ability to, within the first day, filling that data repository from our SAC with upwards of 150 reports. Um, this saved off also money and offered our ability to be flexible in other requirement areas. One of the, the key guides of uh, ACF in regards to reporting was that they indicated on prior vendor procurements that training would be uh, become obsolete or be, I guess, removed as a result of budget and also reporting. Uh, because reporting, though it's key, getting out that first initial SAC list and rollout reports sometimes suffer. Um, so in those areas, we decided to kind of secure um, our, our budget for and our, our scope creep by kind of offsetting that with our own IT. Next. One of the, I touched on this earlier, one of the issues that arises during the course of development is that through over 36 months there are key areas and policy areas that change. NIDID is one that we have incorporated in our, in our system as we're going towards April 30th, and this, is, this was an issue. We had to draw a line with our policy folks to, to try and estimate and freeze a date that we could absolutely not change any more uh, development or offer any more change controls. This was very hard, but through our governance, we were able to control this. And what this is, allows you to implement on a date, but then it it closely behind your implementation, you're executing your new policy change controls. So. Again, freezing that, freezing that policy and having that rapport with your, your policy program folks in order to understand and the expectation that the new system will change, but there is a point where we have to freeze. So we were successful in the point that we were able to squeak in knighted, but we were not able to squeak in some other new policies, um, and we're going to have to schedule those out for our, our new um, capacity model. This was, this was an area, control physical space. This might not seem like a big deal, but being physically on the project, uh, the space is <laughs> paramount. Part of a, a, vendor, a vendor selection process was that they would bid uh, actually to locate in, in phys physical space. Uh, this is a this is actually a large billable item within a contract. By us, uh, ACF actually gave us consult on this and said, you know, if you can procure space separately so that you can you can really start day one. The average vendor was stating that they would take three three months to come into the city and Lansing in Michigan and be able to set up shop. That means procure space, get people on. We didn't have three months uh, within our time cycle. It was actually cheaper for us to co-locate ourselves in a building that was within walking distance of our policy program office and our state DTMB. What that allowed us to do is we could do rapid requirement sessions concurrently with those physical conference spaces all located, and then you're also located with your your vendor IT staff. It very much uh, contained the project, 
and allowed uh, allowed folks to, to physically manage, you know, in a in a space as well as those uh, kind of that that logistical management of checking out rooms and so forth. So that part of of controlling that physical space was was really was really critical for us. Next. All right, Lori, I, uh, I want to thank you. Um, as you were walking through your processes and your project, it certainly brought back um, a lot of memories. And I, um, I wholeheartedly support absolutely everything that um, you have done in terms of controlling scope, uh, managing scope. And um, I, again, I, I uh, totally agree with with the physical location of of, um, of of everyone who is working on the project. If you're together, it, it just seems to work out a lot easier. So I thank you. And now I would just like to ask Tom and Susan and Colleen um, to add any additional comments to what Lori has presented. Uh, what processes has your state implemented to ensure that the project includes all the work required and only the work required to complete the project successfully. Well, this is this is Tom here, Joyce. One one thing that I would say that um, Lori touched on is that um, engaging the stakeholders in the planning process is really important. And often the stakeholders, the business side, um, could be, I say that because I come from the technical side naturally, but don't understand the complexity of what we're building. And by engaging the stakeholders in the planning process, you start to educate them of, of, about how much is really needed in order to support any given piece of functionality that they might need. And I think it helps a lot to educate them um, about the implications of what they're asking for when they ask for a change and, and what the downstream impacts can be on the whole project schedule. This is Colleen. Um, I would concur. When it comes to requirement sessions, we have we have to go back and add. We've added multiple requirement sessions. So our state team starts first with making sure that they understand what the policy requirements are and the changes. So they sit by themselves and they review it. And then they bring in the business owners, the policy unit, the end users to discuss it again. Um, and then they may have another meeting with, uh, that includes the vendor as well so that they can get an understanding of what's being discussed because they have to program this and design this. And then we make sure that it's well documented in the statement of work. So those two processes we use here uh, to make sure that the requirements are well understood up front and that they're clearly documented in the statement of work for the vendors so that they can move forward and build what we need them to build. Absolutely. Susan, I know that you're um, in some form of planning stage for a Pennsylvania SAC list. Does all this uh, um, make sense? Um, it certainly does. And actually, we're um, for phase one of our project. Our project actually has four phases. And we are just finishing up detailed design um, of phase one. So one of the things that, that we do here, and I'm sure many of the other states do this, is um, we also have a governance process that includes that change control board. And when we have changes um, that are requested or we realize we need a change, um, we have a formal process where we document, review, and prioritize the changes. Um, and we're currently using a tool called Team Foundation Server, um, which allows you to, to document that. And once it's documented and prioritized, initially prioritized, we have our vendors do an impact analysis. So we have a, a vendor that supports us on our business side and then a vendor that supports us on our technical side. And they bring that impact analysis back to us um, and then we have the 
technical vendor who would actually be doing the development um, give us a level of effort, which would include the cost of the change, if there is any cost to the change. Um, and then we would bring all that information back to our change control board and make a decision at that point if we could. Now, there could be a situation where, um, you know, if there's a, an impact cost or schedule that requires a higher level of um, discussion with our steering team, then we would take it to a steering team where um, we would have the inclusion of our um, CIO from our department as well as our uh, deputy secretary for our program office who is basically the sponsor of the project. Um, so that's, that's really what we've been following and it, it's actually a cycle that kind of repeats itself every two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the urgency of the change. Good. So, um, so wonderful additional comments. Uh, Lori, I don't know if um, you have anything that you want to add, given what your colleagues have, have offered. I, I concur with the, the, change, the governance and the change control board. Uh, that is absolutely key um, in operational, tactical, and the executive level that they all be involved. And there's a, you know, the weekly cadence right now during, you know, of a, of a change, control, change control board that where exactly what she's, you know, she indicated we followed the same rule. And it really boils down to that ability to um, control, control those requirements and those requests and really go to the health of the application and controlling the expectations of the, of the, of the business owners, if you will, or the policy program office, um, because that really could implode your, your requirements process because everybody, you know, would agree that a, a change can be made um, at a certain time, but do you need it right now and should you pay for it um, with the vendor? So thank you. Absolutely. Excellent comment. So um, let's move on and let's go from our discussion on managing project scope to setting up the context and talking about project scope creep. And I'm going to turn this over, this segment, over to Susan and Colleen. And here you go. Thank you. Okay. So project scope creep, everybody's favorite word. Um, so the definition is uh, in front of you on the page. You really, it's about adding functionality that you didn't really agree to or talk to talk about um, at the beginning of your requirement sessions or as you're defining the work that you want to do. But I love the quotes here. We just realized we forgot. Can we add one more thing? It's not what we need or that's not what I expected. And I have to confess that in my early days, or maybe last year, um, I have been guilty of, of uttering these words. Um, you get in design sessions and you realize that you've forgotten something. Lori from Michigan talked about 2,800 requirements. That's a lot, especially when you're starting a new system, to try to remember and manage every piece of the work that you, that you have. So scope creep happens. We don't like it. We don't want it. But you know, what are some of the causes? Next slide. So when we start the work and define the scope, we need to make sure that we're ready to have that conversation. Um, I think somebody mentioned or will men talk about making sure that you're freezing policy. You've got to make sure, you've got to clearly define what it is that you want to work on. What is it that you want to build? Are you building a bread box? You know, are you building a car? What is the scope of the work? What is the hardware you'll be using? What's the software? What do we want to do? And then when we, then we get into the requirements analysis. Uh, we talked a lot about the end users and making sure that they're involved in the, in the process. Um, and we've got to spend enough time making sure that we are gathering the business requirements. You know, they say haste makes waste, but it also makes unhappy end users. Um, because we're not having the in-depth conversation, the width and breadth of the conversation around the business requirements that we need. 
um, and I mentioned earlier that we came to this realization, you know, a couple of years ago. So we added some additional steps to, to our business requirements process, where, as I said, it started out with our team making sure that we understood what the policies were, what the work was, and then we started having conversations with the end users, multiple conversations, making sure that we understood what the requirements were. And then we would send the document out to them um, again and get their feedback and make sure that, the, you know, they're signing off on this is what, the, you know, the requirements are and we want to build. The other thing is don't assume, you know, what they need. Um, and this is something also that we, you know, we've talked about here because the state team is comprised of individuals that have come from the field and have done the work. But we haven't been in the field in a while, so we have to resist the temptation that even though we've been CPS workers or foster care workers, we don't always know. We've been out of the field for a while. So we have to have that input because um, they are the most recent participants in the work. They understand the nuances better than we do. So, you know, don't make any assumptions. Uh, next slide. Poorly written project requirements. Requirements that are open to interpretation are ambiguous leads to poor design and, again, unhappy end users. You have to make sure that the requirements are well discussed. Um, it, it, it's a lot of energy and a lot of time that you have to spend on the front end, but it's worth it. Um, and you have to make sure that they're fully documented. I mean, uh, I mentioned earlier that we document it, we send it out to the uh, business owners and users, and make sure that they sign off on it, that we haven't missed anything. And it's also the document that you go back to as you're going through the design uh, to make sure that you're on the same page and that you've gotten what you need. Um, Laurie mentioned poor project control or lack of change control. Laurie mentioned this earlier. It's really important to have a change control process in place um, and that if you have one in place that you're, you're following that process. Um, you know, despite our best efforts of documenting requirements and having those conversations, Things come up and, um, and things change. You may need to add something. Um, and the best way to handle that is through the change control process. You know, it's a, it's a good check and balance for the team. Um, there may be funding issues that have come, come along the way since you started. Priorities have been a change. Events may have occurred that you're not aware of. So that group can help you prioritize some of the things that are coming up that are causing some of the changes or changes that, that are being asked for. Next. Um, understanding the complexity of the project. You have to be realistic about the work effort, about um, which leads you to um, ensure that you have the right resources and the right skill set. You know, one of the things you don't want to do is undertake, for example, you know, changing your entire intake process and thinking that you can only do it in three months. You're trying to cram too many requirements and too much scope into a short period of time. So you've got to understand how complex your, um, your work is at that point. Not involving uh, users early enough. They've uh, I think we all we all understand it, but we keep to keep need to keep saying it um, because sometimes there's a temptation not to want to do this. But you've got to involve the end users very early. They they're the ones that are going to be using this or not if it's not designed uh, to meet their needs. And again, not assuming that you know what they want or need. Make sure you ask the question many times. Um, and document it. You've got to involve them throughout the entire cycle. Requirements, analysis, design, and I know we're not talking about testing here, but also on the testing phase. We've got to, we've got to include them through the entire process. Next, and I think it's Susan. Yeah, thank you, Colleen. Sure. Continuing 
continuing kind of the discussion around the, the stakeholders and making sure that they're involved, um, I, I think you, you can't really emphasize that enough, um, that they are involved throughout uh, the whole project. Um, in our project here in Pennsylvania, um, it is the, the development of a child welfare information solution um, that is very, it's very new to all of the stakeholders in Pennsylvania that are involved. Um, we have a large number of stakeholders um, that have many different roles, and so they're going to look at what they're getting from the system in very different ways. Um, we have, we're a state, a county administered state, so we have 67 counties um, that have an interest in this and will not necessarily be using our system um, since the way that we're designing this is that we will do data exchanges with the counties. Um, and then we have um, state workers. We are currently redoing our child abuse hotline um, and the system that helps support the processing of child abuse clearances here in Pennsylvania. And so we have, we're building pieces that have to actually communicate with each other. And we've been engaging our stakeholders um, from different perspectives. Um, we're establishing a self-service portal where we will actually have, the public will be able to access that to obtain child abuse clearances. So their perspective and their needs are going to be very different from the needs of um, the child line, hot, the child line uh, workers who are answering the hotline and taking reports. And so our public users um, doing clearances, we actually do about half a million clearances a year. Um, and then we're also um, allowing our mandated reporters to access this self-service portal to make reports of suspected child abuse. Um, and there's about 21,000 reports that come in a year from mandated reporters. Um, and, and currently what they have to do is, is do those orally to our hotline workers and they'll be able to now do them electronically. So it was there's a lot of balancing that's going on trying to look at all the different user um, needs and making sure that some of those um, needs aren't contradicting each other. <laughs> um, the other thing I would suggest in, in terms of gathering your requirements prematurely or not um, finalizing your policy, that can, can cause a lot of problems too. Um, so one of the things I would recommend is doing similar to what Colleen was saying, is really onboarding your processes, your business processes, um, as well as the, the processes then that you're going to use for managing your project to your subject matter experts, as well as um, any of your business analysts that would not be familiar with it. Um, they need to have an understanding of what the project is trying to achieve um, and what the vision of the project is and the, the end product is um, so that everybody is talking about the same requirements and achieving the same goals. I also would recommend uh, some level of business process um, reengineering prior to jumping into requirements for any business areas that do not have well-documented or defined business processes. Um, and an example of this is we have four regional offices here at um, the state, which are state, they're state employees and they oversee the county children and youth agencies, but they have some of their own functions as well. Um, and it became very obvious since they had no automated system that they were all doing their business processes differently. So they all had to do the same thing, but no, none of them did it the same way. Um, and so by not kind of preparing them ahead of time, we ended up being in the requirement sessions and trying to figure 
figure this out. So we had to, to step back and actually um, look at how they could start agreeing on what their business processes should be um, in order for us to automate them. Next. Okay, um, here I guess I would just want to make sure that your stakeholders um, also understand throughout the, the requirement sessions and the design sessions um, what decisions have already been made. Um, because you do get into those situations then throughout the whole process where Stakeholders are arguing over what functionality should be in or what was agreed upon prior. And if, if not all of the stakeholders can be in all of those requirement sessions and design sessions, which it's, it's impossible to have that happen in a large project, then some of them don't necessarily understand why decisions had been made. Um, and, and then what happens is you will have to revisit those things, and that takes time. Um, gold plating, uh, the practice of exceeding the scope of a project in the belief it is adding value. Um, here we really, we again go back to our change control process and looking at if somebody's coming up with a new requirement or a change requirement, really assessing the value of that requirement. You know, what does that add to the end product? Um, we've had a lot of occurrences where some of the subject matter experts um, have brought things up that they think the system should do, but they're really only, they're like one-off things that only happen five times a year. And so you have to have that discussion and, and let them talk about that, but have a discussion around what kind of value does that really bring, and is it worth building that into an automated system. Um, as far as the developers adding new features, um, we haven't really run into that here as far as them adding new functionality. Uh, I think my comment on that is, what we've experienced is that they come up with design um, ideas or decisions which tend to kind of change the scope or um, maybe affect the scope in a way. And, and their decisions are based on, on technical or design um, decisions, not necessarily business driven decisions. Um, and, I, and I guess an example of this is we have, you know, we have a lot of enterprise systems and if we want to reuse one of those systems or, or build pieces of our system um, into that framework, then there are constraints around that and there might be a decision made that we have to do something a certain way, um, which then has us going back and thinking about, well, then that's going to change really how we're doing our business. So um, that's kind of what we've experienced from the, the vendor perspective. Um, okay, next. Establishing the, the context. Not all project scope creep can be avoided. Um, and I think that's definitely true. Um, there is unavoidable scope creep. We have had um, here in Pennsylvania uh, some major legislative changes. Um, and just try kind of to put this in context, um, we started phase one of our project in March 2013 with our business requirements. Um, and we had done high-level business requirements, you know, before in order to get our procurement, but, but we went back and revalidated um, some of those requirements because here in Pennsylvania, too, it's, it's procurement's like a two-year process. Um, 
And so now we are in finalizing our design, and we will um, go into production in December of 2014. Um, so a couple years ago, we had a major uh, event occur here in Pennsylvania with the Sandusky um, crisis, and we had a task force on child protection that was established to actually look at our Child Protective Services law. So while we were in the process of doing um, the business requirements, um, there was a whole lot of legislation introduced. Um, and basically, it's, it's almost an entire rewrite of our Child Protective Services law. Um, and those bills were actually only passed in late 2013 and early 2014. Um, so most of them only actually were passed while we were in GSD. So we were dealing with changing requirements and changing policy all throughout this project. And um, because we stayed very much involved with the legislation and that whole process, we were able to build some of that into um, our requirements. Um, however, it was very difficult to finalize anything because until a bill is passed, as you know, um, there could be many changes. Um, and then in addition to that, um, like I said, we, we here at um, the department, from a cost savings, I guess, perspective or a more centralization of your IT services, they they like to make use of what they call the enterprise systems or services. Um, and so when you have multiple program offices using the same system, there's often other activity going on which affects, you know, could affect your timelines. Um, and you're often, uh, it, it's difficult to keep yourself abreast of all the other um, activities that are going on. So that has been a challenge as well. Um, and so now I will hand it over to Tom. So could we have the next slide, please? I'm just struck by listening to all this of how, how difficult it, it really is and how complex the, the um, issues that we have are around scope um, and around defining what what a system needs to do. And for me, some some of this comes down to, you know, in the words of Pogo, we've met the enemy and he is us. Because I I do think that uh, some of the problems that we're dealing with here are related to the methodologies that we use in software development, i.e., waterfall versus agile, and it, it's particularly difficult to address this um, when you're engaging with a vendor, um, a prime contractor who, who needs a definition up front of, of what's going to happen on a project in order to make a bid on it. And Minnesota and it, the development of ITSAC was, took a different approach to development in that um, we did not engage with a prime contractor and manage the project uh, in-house. We use contracted resources uh, throughout the project and still do from time to time, but uh, in a staff augmentation sort of way. So that has some impact on my perspective on it. But we certainly started initially with with waterfall. And you know, my observations on waterfall are you're, you're really trying to boil the ocean. Um, and particularly at the front end of a project uh, where the users don't have a relationship with you to begin with, there's a tendency on the part of, a, of the end users to want to, to jam in every feature and requirement they can. And, and it, you know, I think in the user's defense, they're convinced that they're only going to get one shot with IT and need to get everything in um, up front. And um, there's some truth to that with some of these projects. We, you know, and I and I, I think we need to consider 
the methodology that we use and plan for change over the, the, the development cycle of the project rather than um, at, you know rather than be surprised by it. The other thing that happens with with trying to define everything up front is you're trying to anticipate what's basically unknowable and with all of this, and I and I was struck by Susan's remark about the uh, doing the business process reengineering prior to requirements. I think that's very valid, but the act of introducing a new system um, is injecting change into an existing system. And I think the very the very fact that we're um, doing that implies that the requirements do change because we're because of the change we're introducing, it, it's hard to predict what the outcome of that's going to be. So it's hard for the users to anticipate what the requirements are going to be until they see something. So um, all this is hard, <laughs> um, really hard. Could, could I have the next slide, please? So this slide and, and um, the next one, which looks similar, I'm, I'm, I borrowed from IBM and I'm using it with, with their permission. But I'm engaged on a, a short project using IBM as a resource um, to implement some enterprise service bus technology in our area. And, and IBM is coming in and engaging with, with um, IT here in Minnesota, but, we're all, but also and maybe primarily engaging with the business users, users in order to, um, to do this project. And, and so while the primary goal is to implement an enterprise service bus and get it up and running and do some knowledge transfer to the state IT people, it's important in the course of the project for it to be successful to deliver a piece of um, functionality that um, is of significant benefit to the business. And so IBM is talking about how do we do that. And, and part of that conversation was the traditional software development lifecycle waterfall versus iterative. And here what they're showing is that um, at project initiation, you're trying to define uh, the outcome that you're going to get quite some time down the road. And you're, you're likely going to fall short of that desired outcome. And it's a very complicated uh, process to do this, to, to nail down all the requirements up front and to really get the level of definition that you need to do that. And, and I think it, it really does involve um, everything that's been talked about in regard to managing scope and, and careful change control, et cetera. Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a daunting process. Could, could I have the next slide, please? With Agile, then, um, we're dealing with shorter uh, development cycles. We're trying to deliver incremental functionality with continuous enhancement improvement. We're trying to start smaller and gradually build out the functionality. And the most important thing for me is I'm trying to develop a long-term partnership with my business users so, users so that there's, there's trust here that if I'm not delivering a piece of functionality in this iteration, there's another iteration coming where I am going to deliver that functionality. And, and that's, that's the key, I think, to, to managing some of this is that um, the users you, you have a trust relationship with your users that you are going to deliver, and that you, you um, it is long term. It's not just a short term, one project kind of thing. And again, I, I think that is particularly difficult in, when you're trying to manage a vendor as well. Um, I am engaged with another area of the agency outside of child welfare where we are engaging with a vendor. And um, in the statement of work for that, which is kind of an abbreviated version of an RFP, um, we're trying to address the needs of uh, Agile development and our desire to use Agile development uh, on that project. So for instance, in that RFP or statement of work, we're asking for the vendors to show experience um, having worked uh, on Agile projects. We're asking for education or, or certification as Scrum Masters, which is one of the roles on an Agile project, et cetera. So we're trying to bake into the into the uh, request for proposals the qualifications a vendor would need to have in order to to work successfully in agile, 
And we're taking the approach on that to try to define the uh, deliverables that we want, um, but will still allow the flexibility of uh, fleshing those out during agile iterations. And it is certainly a balancing act to do that. It takes a lot of judgment. Um, and it, it, it's, again, it's not easy. Could, could I have the next slide, please? And oh, I've lost some of it. Is there is there another piece to this? Yeah, just bring it all. Okay, right there. So what's being shown here then is incremental iterations, as opposed to the waterfall that that get us to pretty much the same outcome, but we're we're taking it a bite at a time. And in agile, it's it's, it's kind of hard to have scope creep because by definition what you're doing is you're, you're delivering a small piece of functionality, you're implementing some working code, and then you're taking a look at what is the next fun piece of functionality that needs to be required. So of course you need to, you know, you need to set an overall scope. It can't just go anywhere and, and set parameters to work within. But um, the intent here is that change is a natural part of the process, and we accommodate through that throughout the um, life cycle. The other, um, the other thing I find with, with Agile, which we use here on our project to manage on an ongoing basis, is that it kind of turns things on its head in regard to change. And we try to accommodate the change up front, as opposed to managing it through change control at the end. So we have an idea of what the development capacity is at the, at the front end of an iteration. And we force the, the business or the, the process owner to make decisions at the front of the iteration as far as what they want. And because these are short iterations, a matter of a, of a month or so, um, we don't introduce new requirements in the middle of that month. And so we're we're um, we're we're delivering delivering that functionality as we go, and and if there are changes that are needed due to um, changes in policy or changes in understanding that that the uh, based on the system that we're delivering, if, if those are occurring, they're going to be accommodated in a future iteration. So it, it kind of leaves room for the unknowns. Another. Uh, general observation on all of this is um, to the extent that you can keep flexibility in your designs that preserve options, that you're going to have a system that can better uh, adapt to change. Um, one of the examples of that, to be a little less abstract, is in, in the system uh, that we have here, we have uh, <coughs> grids with a lot, with a great deal of functionality in so within a, within a grid in our application that presents data, the user can select to include or exclude different fields. The grids can be sorted in different ways. The data can be exported to Excel for, for further analysis or graphing. And so with that kind of flexibility, we reduce the need for defined reports up front. And trying to, trying to take that sort of approach throughout the project throughout the design process to look for where, where can you be flexible, where, where can you um, provide more options, I think also helps reduce scope creep because it's, you're more easily able to accommodate needs without necessarily making a, a system change. And the other, the other thing with Agile that the users quickly come to understand is uh, when they come to us and want to add something during an iteration, we say, that's fine. What do you want to take out? <laughs> so we, we're working within a fixed amount of capacity. We're working on a, on, a, on a relatively fast schedule. And so if you're asking for more, you've got to ask for less somewhere else. We're simply, simply not able to. Um, we don't have infinite capacity here. Um, And I, th I think, Joyce, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. There's certainly more All right. today, but that seems reasonable. All right. Thank you. Um, um, Tom, I, um, I, while listening to your uh, 
Steele on Agile. I have a question, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but here goes. Um, it seems as though one of the um, philosophies of Agile is that it welcomes um, changing requirements, even late in the development cycle. And given that most, in fact, I think all that I know of, SACLIS, projects are fixed price. Um, do you think that Agile can adapt to a fixed price environment? Um, we're, I'm about to find that out on this other project <laughs> I was talking about. So in that RFP, we're specifying features that we want at reasonable level of detail, but the contract is to develop the functional requirements needed to deliver those features and then do the development of them. So it is, it is Joyce, it's really a balance in here to try to set an overall broad scope but leave enough room for an agile project process to get there. And, and I, I do think it's um, I do think it's difficult, but I think our traditional ways are also difficult. And I'm, I'm hoping um, with this vendor engagement that we can have the same kind of success that we've had with internal staff. But you know, ask me in about six months and I'll have a better answer for you. I think we'll all be waiting for um, the results of your efforts because I think uh, we'll be uh, <clears throat> touching on Agile and Waterfall and other and development methodologies at perhaps some later uh, webinar. So, Elizabeth, um, let's move on to the next slide, please. Oops. Okay. Um, very quickly, so that we save ample time for um, attendee questions, does do any of the panelists or presenters uh, want to add anything in terms of your development methodology and, and the scope that it's had on your project? Um, not all. Do you think all scope creep is, creep is negative? Um, I invite your comments. I do want to let you know that Lori, uh, Johnson has had to step out for a minute. As you know, they're going live very soon. They are shutting down their old payment system uh, this week, so she had some things that uh, she needed to attend to. So, Tom, Colleen, Susan, is there anything that you would like to add or comment on? Well, this is Tom. I, you know, as far as whether all scope creep is negative, I. I, w I don't. Personally, I don't think so. I think it's understandable. Um, at the, during the design phase and the requirements definition phase, things are quite abstract. I think it's hard for people to understand um, at that phase what it is exactly that you're going to be delivering. And when they actually see a deliverable and say, oh my gosh, that isn't what I meant, I think it's understandable. So um, although it can have a negative impact on the project schedule, um, in the end, changes in scope, you know, are often needed in order to have a successful project. So I would say to that one, I don't believe it, it is all negative. And I think we all would agree. Uh, Colleen, Susan, any additional comments you'd like to make? Um, just more lessons learned in terms of involving end users. <coughs> um, I think we all realize how criti critical it is to involve them. And, you know, in respect, to respect their time, you know, we attempted to do things using technology and using webinars and web access uh, to make sure that, you know, that we were being inclusive. However, we found out that that really doesn't work. Uh, for us, in, in terms of scope creep, what we found out was that, you know, the end users were coming back to us saying, I missed something, I didn't add this requirement, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't hear that point, I didn't add this. So, you know, it added to our, to our issues around scope creep because we were attempting to use the 
latest technology to accommodate, you know, their schedules and their locations and their time. So, I, you know, that was an interesting uh, finding for us. Good comment, Colleen. Uh, Susan, anything you want to add, or shall we move on to our uh, questions from our attendees? Um, I think you can move on. It'd be nice to Alrighty. know if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth, um, I'm going to turn this over to you to open, ask for the phone lines to open up, and if we have any questions submitted through the chat feature. Our operator and Camille, can you go ahead and give our audience instructions on how to line up for questions on the phone? Yes. At this time, we'll begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star 1 on your touchstone phone. Please unmute your phone and record your first and last name clearly when prompted. To withdraw your request, press star 2. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, press star then 1 and record your name. And one moment, please, for our first question. Okay, and while we're waiting, we do have a few questions from the chat line. Uh, first, have any of the states had the experience that as you go through requirements, you actually um, discard them because participants say, we don't need this? Uh, Tom here from Minnesota. Uh, yeah, certainly. I think uh, primarily where I see that is in regards to the business process reengineering. So we'll start off um, thinking we're going to uh, do one task, and then as, as we get deeper into the business process reengineering, we realize that um, it's really something else altogether that's going to cause the issue, and it is causing the issue. That we're trying to find. Yeah, this is calling the same thing. I think what it is is the business. As you start talking, they're bringing their work on paper. And, you know, the initially the requirement is based around that paper process. And as you start getting into design and they're seeing how the system can automate some of the work, they realize I really don't need the signature or this approval or to do this work the way that I'm doing it on paper. So we discard the requirement. Yeah, and I, this is Sue. I would also agree because I think, um, especially in our state, we had used our legacy applications for so long that there were many workarounds that had to be put in place. And so the way they were doing it may not have really been the way that it should have been done. And once they realize that, then they may not need a certain requirement. Any other responses? A uh, second question from online. Um, I'd be curious about whether speakers think the pace of the Agile process will make it difficult to maintain documentation and to engage in traditional change control processes. For the Tom here. So, so for us, we're most successful with, with this one. Engaged in the uh, process where we have uh, business users, business analysts, and developers and the analysts are creating the documentation as we go. If we don't do that, then we do get into trouble with it, and no one's happy. And, and that is a that is something that needs managed in agile. Is how do you, how do you get the documentation that you need? So we include people during the process who are creating the documentation as we're going along. Any other responses? Okay, Camelia, do we have any questions on the phone? There are no questions on the phone line. Um, another one online. What have you seen as the what have you seen as the most negative aspect of scope creep? Impact on time schedule or on the cost of the project? What Tom from Minnesota here? I think the, the 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 time is a huge factor. The other thing that happens with scope creep, in my experience, is it can drive quality down because you're trying you're you're pushing more features into a product. Um, it's difficult to to get a handle around all the 
quality control that needs to happen. And, and often a late project is made later as you're pushing more features into it, and it sort of snowballs. So I think time and quality, you know, of course, that will impact cost. This is Colleen. For me, it's hard to separate, but for me, I think schedule. Um, you have expectations of the, from the field of things being delivered, and they're waiting for certain functionality to come, and it's you know it's taking longer. Um, the uh, the staff or the, your team, you know, they're getting a little frustrated because the, the schedule keeps flipping. So I think for me, the schedule is the most negative. It has the most negative impact. And this is Sue. I think in most circumstances, I I would agree with Colleen. It would be the schedule. I think in, for us in this phase of our project, because all of our, I mean, our deadline is basically um, written in legislation, so we can't really extend. Um, it, it's probably going to be cost for this for this phase. Elizabeth, go ahead. Go ahead. I, was, um, I think we should probably take maybe one more question if we have one. Okay. I don't have any online. Camelia, do we have any on the phone? No questions at this time. Okay. Joyce, I'll turn it back over to you then. Yeah, I uh, I want to thank um, <clears throat> our presenters because I, I think that, as I said, they have been doing this for many years and they have a lot of wisdom to impart. And they have done an excellent job of it. Um, and I wish uh, them all well in, in continuing their success. And I wish uh, to Lori Johnson in Michigan uh, wonderful success in going live with their with their brand new SACLIS system on the 30th. So in terms of what's next, um, <clears throat> there was a, a previous slide of the, our next webinar, which is um, going to be saying goodbye to your vendor, preparing to say goodbye to your vendor, which I think will be quite interesting. So we hope that all of you who have attended um, has found the information to be both informative and valuable as you move forward with your own SACWIS or CWIS initiatives. If you have any additional questions or would like more information from any of the presenters, uh, please do not hesitate to contact me at the email listed above. Uh, again, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available online. When it's complete and posted, we will send you a message via the SACWIS manager's listserv uh, with the with the link to the recording. So thank you all for attending, and please watch for information for the next Children's Bureau sponsored webinar event. With that, I wish you well and say goodbye. Thank you.